episode 122 of a touchline ramp podcast we are here at ashley jones hair we're here with roger jones thank you very much for popping on and saying hello the agenda this week is is roger yeah usually it's we would do sections on certain topics around football all of it's roger obviously it's all you we're just gonna we're gonna introduce you to roger he's gonna tell you his story two big thank yous as well thank you very much bendigo the media for producing this podcast each and every week. And thank you very much to our sponsor this week, Heavy Mental Podcast. You were told that you were being released by Manchester United. Um, at that point, because you said you were 20, yeah, when you, said, yeah, when you got released. At, at any point, had you considered what you would do if you weren't playing football like because obviously you, your career didn't end when you left united however it's that thing of it's the short as we were just saying it's a short career span when you got released it i mean i can't even begin to imagine what you were thinking at that time the statistics saying you're not going to make it I, I was lucky i was quite academic in school but i wasn't academic thinking ah. Oh, this is for, for what I fall back on if I don't yeah. make it. You, you just, to be honest, I was quite academic because I used to like competing against my mates to yeah. <laughs> see who could get the best exam results. It, was, it wasn't like something um, innate in me. Um, when you're 20, like, I don't, you know, even when you're 16, you're not thinking too much of the future. You're still, you, 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 you know, your brain's still like, you, you, part of your brain's still mature until, you know, you don't need to start maturing until you're 21. So you're still like, you're still mature, you know, growing, yeah. essentially. It was weird, you know, I obviously I joined Rodham. It was, just, it was a matter of fact, I had like a trial game for them. I, was play, I think it was the Bolton Reserves or something. And, you know, when you have one of those games and say everything came off and I was like, I just, you knew they were going to ask you to sign. Just, yeah. just purely, you, you, you're just one of those games, you know, and I'm quite, you know, hard on myself, but like, even my dad came off, so like, yeah, you, 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 my dad, you know, my dad wouldn't, berate me but he wouldn't give me you know he was just like kind of middle of the road um but anyway you know i kind of went to rotherham then only basically basically pure purely based on the fact you know there was a couple of other offers rex and um, qpr a couple and i spoke a lot about an hour chat with ian holloway who was qpr manager at the time um, but the only reason i went to rotherham really was because they'd had two successive um promotions so they were in the championship mm. But then when I joined, you know, it was like a massive culture change. You know, you're gonna have to, you you know, not that I was like a prima donna or anything, but it's just mm. you would go from having your kit just, you know, laid out to you every day to having to wash your own kit, you know, for a 20 year old. Just stuff like that, you know, really, really, you're going from the cliff. Oh, well, there was Carrington at the time, you know, you know, they had moved to Carrington, this big training complex, you know, to, to really basic stuff and what. And the guys were, were lovely, they were great. You know, it was obviously you can. A club like Rotherham has two successive promotions. It tells you a lot about the characters yeah. in the team. The only player that they had was you probably really know of, really, was Mark Robbins, who was ex United striker. Yeah. Um, that scored, I think, in the Africa Cup. I think they, it was a game that they said that saved, saved his career. Great, yeah. Yeah. Um, so it was nothing with the boys, but you kind of knew, I knew straight away that this, this is the wrong place for me, but. Felt like I've got you. You've just got to get on with, get on mm. with it now, and it's just, and there's always that element of you like, oh, they've they've worked. <laughs> it's a way. It's no nothing that anyone said. But you just start, start painting and slowly start painting this picture. It was like I thought, oh, some of these players now, you know, they've had, they've worked the heart guts off. You now two mm. successive promotions, and then suddenly the guy who's you know the man you you know comes in and like Did you feel and benefits from all that hard work I d honestly i they, they were they were great like, they were strong characters in the dressing yeah. room you know as i say two successive promotions from a small club of talent massive you know, big characters massive, in that yeah, dressing yeah. Room. um but then so, i started like i was i was unhappy and didn't really want to worry my mum and dad you know that i'm like up in south yorkshire and a lot of the younger lads in the team were local guys, so they had all their family and friends locally. And then a, bit of a, a lot of the older guys had family, like wives and children. So I was kind of caught in a bit of no man's land. And it just shows how quickly, you know, I was always quite fit physically. You know, I always felt like, um, even if you felt like, 
like there's some you know psychological issues mm. that if I got just got fit enough physically, I'd just be able to like just override it. Um, but what happened then? It, it's it's weird how it starts to manifest itself. You know, I had a flat in Wardrobe, and I did have a girlfriend at the time. She was on the year. She, she was studying German in um, uni, so she was over in Germany for the year. So I by myself, and then it's, the, it's little things. You start coming back from training, and then you're like, oh, I can't be bothered just yeah. washing the dishes. Like I haven't got the energy to wash the dishes. I haven't got the energy just to wash my clothes, and you're just leaving things planned up. And then you're like, oh, I'm just going to shut the curtains now, and and roll on the next day, and you, you start isolating yourself. You start, you know, yeah, you, you start cutting yourself away from the world. But I had this, obviously I didn't really know what was happening to me. When I had my knee injuries, it was like, yeah, great, the scan, you know, it's quite mm. clear. You have a scan, it shows there's a you know, tear in your cartilage, we get mm. it fixed. But with this, you're like, well, what's going on here? But I had, I don't know why, I just had that awareness that it was, it was like a doctor practice opposite um, mm. my flat. So I just thought, oh, I'm going to go to the doctor and just like, I'm having these, you know, quote, you know, dark feelings and like mm. just these, um, I, I don't know, it's, it's, it's a weird, I can't, I can't explain it. You just feel like there's a, some, like a, some brain fog, I'd, I'd imagine. Mm. Puts him in a difficult position because he wasn't, I think he wasn't the club doctor but I think he had an affiliation with the club. Mm. So obviously I'd gone to see him without, without the club knowing. Obviously he gave me antidepressants. It's, it's difficult for a doctor. They've got 10 minutes. They, they can't mm. it, talk yeah. about, about what your yeah. lifestyle's like. You yeah. know? And then maybe in that year it, it wasn't a holistic approach. It's more, right, let's get some tablets to fix this. And I was always, always a bit like, you know, I st started taking the tablets, felt like quite numb. Go to training, didn't tell anyone. But I was always a bit like, well, these tablets. Well, I want to feel. I just want to understand why. Well, what? What? What's causing this suffering? Because if you don't understand it, you feel like you're just putting a plaster over over something. Um, but it kind of it started like then affecting me. You know, in terms of let's say I had a reserve game for Rotherham. You know, I was I was playing with for the reserve for them. I I was I'd get up in the morning and if it was an evening kickoff, I'd be like, oh, no, it's going to be a day of just like mentally berating yourself and just just not wanting to get dressed so i'd get to the even before we started so kicking off, I'd, I'd be exhausted yeah arriving and then suddenly it'd, it'd be stuff like you know i, I was always someone who's like quite um led by example i was a captain a lot of teams i played with and suddenly you just be like i don't want the ball i i know yeah. it's like a bullet i i just don't want to be here i just want the ground to swallow me up i never had that experience and i was like looking at the bench I oh, wish I was over there mm. it even ended up to the point I was, I was on the bench for the game for someone who'd been like in United Reserves not long before you know probably 18 months before mm. I was on the bench thinking oh please no one get injured I, I just don't want to go on wow. it's weird so it ended up you know the, the, my manager at the time you know Ronnie Ronnie Moyes old school manager you know obviously very successful on the pitch but I didn't really have any dealings with him on a, yeah. on a personal basis he didn't really, I felt a little bit like guilty because even though I hadn't cost many transfer fees, I'd, I'd come in. I, my knee was still playing up. You know, I did have an operation a couple Seems of months. Like a battle going on. Yeah, there. and then I just I asked to see him, and then like he's probably thinking, oh, he's gonna sit sit me down now and um, and ask me why am I not in the team? You know, really? that's what they used to. But yeah. I was literally, um, why can you just rip up my contract? And he's like, he sat up. He's like, what? This was like Christmas time. I mm. still had six, seven months of my contract to run. So if effectively, if you're saying the rip up my contract, you're saying I don't care about that money, which is, you know, I was 21 at the time, I think. Mm. It's still, it's a fair whack. So he was like, he couldn't understand what, what, what it was. And you, th you think, well, now's the time to say, to be honest with him and say, you mm. know, I, you haven't seen the best of me because I've just not been in a good place. But I, I couldn't, I, even then, you know, I'd worked so hard to, to you know, to start, you know, establish some sort of life in, in football. And it literally just, it kind of ended like There's that. no one to talk to apart from that doctor initially and you didn't feel it... it no, I didn't really, I didn't really speak to anyone in the dressing room. It, it tells you how, how low I was. You know, I've always been quite quiet in the dressing room. I'm not saying like I was like Jack the Lad, you know, but it, mm. I, I, you know, I, I was quite introverted. But a few years later, when I one of the Rotherham players got a million pound move to Cardiff City, Alan Lee. Mm. Um, so I moved in with him and, you know, he's, we hadn't really been that close in Rotherham and he, 
I remember him one day, though, just going to me, and I think we're having the breakfast together, he goes, oh, I, just, I just can't believe the difference. And, and I went, Why, what do you mean? He goes, genuinely, when I thought you were at Rotherham, when, when you were at Rotherham, I thought you were meat. Wow. That's it's just how I, you're, yeah, well, it's just, I, I rarely see that fragility shown in football because it is like a bit of a hyper masculine uh, support in this situation. The first time I, I, was, I was aware of it, the first time I actually saw it was uh, Johnny Williams on uh, Sutherland Till I Die. When he went in and was honest in his approach, he said, Look, I'm, I'm feeling these, these feelings, I feel isolated, I'm annoyed with myself because of the injury. I don't like, and that was all on camera. And I think something like that is such a brave thing to actually like, like speak out over because it's one of those things that there is still a stigma attached and you know for sure it must go on. Now there is more support in terms of mental and physical as well as physical. So it shows you it's a huge part of the game, but it's, re it's still rarely spoken about to this day. It's maybe reflective of, you know, the idea of masculinity, like you said, about you feel, there is that stigma that you feel like it's weak to talk, but mm. we are human, you know, we get, footballers are human, so uh, same in all walks of life, you get different different kinds of you know, some people who, who their backgrounds are they psychologically quite sturdy, or, and you have, have some people who maybe need, you know, same as you'd have maybe someone who needs physically maybe do ways to get stronger and you get someone who, who someone else who's who's built you know quite mm -hmm. strongly doesn't need to do so much work in that area i think it's a sign of strength that someone identifies you know maybe sure. they've gone through their their life they, they are quite sensitive intuitive or what can i do no, not to not to disconnect from because because that sensitivity that deep thinking can be a, a huge asset but it's to be yeah. able to um to channel it really and to, to be able to say you know what, I'm going to work on my mental fitness um, because ultimately everything you do in life, you see through the filter of your mind. So if you're yeah. not doing anything, I, I'd never say, you know, what what works for me maybe wouldn't work for you too, for instance. But yeah. if you're not doing anything, then you're not maybe optimising maybe what life can bring you really yeah it's a huge, huge point yeah. huge point to, to to speak about a bit more speak a bit more openly about yeah. how you feel should we end that one there go on dictate this wrap this up okay, right so where are we in the story where are we in the story um we've so we're we're now coming to terms with with issues outside football really i think this is the the Bread and butter of the story now. This is where I said this is where I think it's going to get really, really interesting. Right. So you said after United, you went to Rotherham. Where? So after you asked for your contract to be ripped up, was it ripped up from there, or what? What was the next step? From yeah. No, there? In all fairness to Rotherham, they did give me a little bit of money, even though they weren't contractually obliged to do so. So in all fairness to them, and mm. um, I just came back and started playing in the League of Wales. I played for Cumbrian and Command, and then suddenly the. Um, the joy's coming back. Yeah. A great bunch of lads. Um, but unfortunately, my knee was still, still deteriorating. So it kind of ended up with me going to see the knee consultant. Um, I was 24 at the time. And he basically, I, I took my manager with me and he said, oh, I'm not going to beat around the bush. Um, Rodri got a knee of a 50-year-old ex footballer at 24. So then, you know, at that, at that point, you're thinking, you know, you're thinking ahead of if you have children and stuff, you want to be able to play with your children. Yeah, it's your health and is. Yeah, that, 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 that comes first and foremost. So I just made that decision then to um, to to retire. Um, what happens then is that you immediately start, you know, to be honest, it was a bit of relief to begin because I I got to the point where I was playing on a, on a, on a Saturday and my knee had swelled up and by the following Saturday, I'm still trying to get the swelling down. So when you start doing that time mm. and time again, it can get quite... Um, quite taxing yeah um so you have a bit of relief think oh yeah i'm gonna have my saturdays back but that soon wears off and then you're like <laughs> um i've wrapped up so much of my identity in football it's been all i've really known and since, it's the routine yeah it's, it's all i've really known and it's all that people really associate me with so i'd go yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd be, but cash not a big place i'd bump into people go oh, how's the year you still playing and mm. you know that People mean well, but then suddenly thinking, well, what what am I without being a footballer? Um, 
but I've still got that perfectionist and that that kind of drive in me. Yeah. And you know, I've managed to um, develop a career in television, um, mm-hmm. so work as a producer director. But then you're still building that career on a feeling of lack of self worth from probably as back as when Sergi, you know, f- from then. You always hear the stories about people who've oh, I had, I had every, all the external luxuries and I felt empty inside because mm-hmm. you're not doing it from, you're either doing, you're probably doing it from a place of fear and you're not doing it from a place that's authentic to, yeah. to yourself. And it takes courage then to be able to face up to those things and, and change course in life. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I probably had that realization that, you know, if I, you still have those bouts of, you know, of, melancholy like depression and stuff but you kind of ride those out a little bit and you know i've kind of i i've spent years maybe um trying to understand my mind just kind of training my own mind really um to, you know kind of develop myself from the inside out because i know i can't physically excel anymore yeah. so you're kind of trying to build up i like what i'd call it mental freedom really mm-hmm. so you, it doesn't mean you retreat from the world and become a hermit but you just you can still be ambitious in the world, be it taken from, uh, from a place of, if if I succeed in what, whatever that task is, mm. it's okay. If, if I don't succeed at it, it's still okay. You know, that it's kind of ex- accepting everything, um, not, not, in a, not in a passive way. So it's a change of perspective yeah. for the world around yeah. you. Yeah, yeah. And, then, and, this, and then it was something, right? I, there was a, I saw, saw an article, um, well, it, you know, obviously the suicide rate is so high for men, and yep. you know we live in a world that we were safer than ever. And for for guys to feel like that is the last way out is unfortunate. And but I've kind of been there. It's, it's that feel of um, it's not wanting to take your own life. It's wanting to stop thinking. It's that feel so of you start thinking you're a burden. You know, and that that's the problem if you keep things to yourself if you don't talk. Because ultimately, sometimes if you just at, uh, even just to, even if I just went to the wall and started talking about what I've been thinking and, and mm. feeling, you feel better because it kind of it, 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 sometimes just hearing yourself say those words can trigger something. Instead of being, but even head. better if you can speak to someone, you know, maybe if even if it isn't doctor, someone who knows you, you can just just shed that bit of light yeah. about the, the, that dark tunnel that, you, that you're kind of going down, really. And um, so, so that's partly my. Um, just regulating your mental health. Yeah, and that, that's and been my ability most, to talk. Yeah, and time to change worlds. I've been doing um, a, a kind of campaign um, called "Talking Is a Lifeline," which is aimed predominantly at men. So, so the, what that what's that involved is um, t- that's been. So what happens of, with time to yeah, change? Uh, my, my role um, fundamentally has been going out and presenting and just saying my story and just saying the stuff that I've done just to help myself. It's, it's always weird, you know, you'll kind of present yeah. and you'll see men, you know, for some men, you know, they might, yeah, enjoy enjoy the talk, but they can't relate to it. They've, you know, they, mm. they haven't got any any of those issues on, on, a, on a personal level or mm. they don't know anyone who's afflicted. But when you know that one in four um, people are like to be affected by men's law, there's always something something you can do to pull in a positive direction. So for me, you know, the issue of mental health, some people are always automatically related to mental mm-hmm. health illness. But what about, you know, you don't automatically, if someone mentions physical fitness, you don't automatically think of breaking your leg and, and mm-hmm. injuries. You think physical fitness is something positive, is mm-hmm. something I'm going to you know, work on and, um, and, and make sure it's an asset. You know, I, I think the key thing in life is to have ultimate freedom is to, you can't have freedom in life if, unless you know how to master your own mind. Well, sure. I, th- I think you could. I think you could. I think you just crushed it there. But yeah, I don't think you can hope for a better way of ending in that yeah. section. Thank you so much. That's it for another week. Thank you very much, Rodri. I think it's an episode which, yeah, a lot of people will get a lot for, from. So thank you very much once again to Heavy Mental Podcast for sponsoring this episode. Go check them out. Uh, at Heavy Mental Pod on Instagram. Thank you very much to Bendy Getting Media. Once again, producer of the podcast. Dre, it's been it's been brilliant having you on. Touch, touch,